This talk is about understanding the shadow. We are part of the life of nature and part of the life of the universe, and we are completely unaware of this relationship. Ignorance of our own nature is one of the fundamental causes of human suffering. If we don't understand why things happen to us or why we behave the way we do, we react unconsciously to events and we are the victims of our fate. This is the way life has been lived for thousands of years and this is why understanding the shadow is so important. The shadow is the unknown aspect of our psyche or soul. It is part of the mysterious lunar inner world rather than the solar world we are familiar with. There are certain questions we may ask ourselves during our life. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where do I go when I die? And why am I here on this planet? The answers to these questions come to us from our inner world, from what the shadow holds. We have, so to speak, been living in the dark for a very long time, unable to find the answers to these questions that are so important for an understanding of why we are here and what our role on this planet might be other than to survive and procreate. The answers to these questions do exist, but have not been accessible to more than a handful of individuals in relation to the billions of souls who have incarnated on the planet. They were known to the founders of four great spiritual traditions who all spoke of our essential, divine, immortal nature and the path to the experience of it. They taught that this path is the active expression of love and compassion for all life on this planet. But their teaching has not yet been fully understood. The Hindu Upanishads spoke of the indwelling divine Atman. The Buddha spoke of our Buddha nature. Lao Tzu spoke of the Tao and how to align ourselves with it. And Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven within us and that is spread out all around us, although we cannot see it. Yet now, through the science of quantum physics, we are discovering that through a vast network of electromagnetic fields, we are connected to the Earth, the Sun and the far distant galaxies. So we are not separate from any aspect of planetary or cosmic life. This is illustrated in the Hindu tradition by the beautiful image of the net of Indra. It can be imagined as a shining golden net surrounding our planet and connecting all forms of life on it. But it embraces not only planetary life, but all galactic life in the cosmos. Through this shimmering web of light, all existence, whether seen or unseen, is an indissoluble unity. We are not only in this incandescent web of light, we are co-creators with it. These astounding discoveries from science tell us that we are literally bathed in a sea of light, invisible to us yet permeating every cell of our being. We are not only connected with each other through the astonishing reach of the internet, but through the infinitesimal particles of subatomic matter. In our essence, we are all beings of light, cosmic beings. At the subatomic quantum level, all apparently separate aspects of life are connected in one invisible and indivisible whole. We, as observers, are therefore not separate from what we are observing. At the deepest level, all life is essentially one. This was known to the great enlightened founders of the four spiritual traditions.
In the different language of spirituality, we can imagine the soul of the cosmos as a cosmic sea of being, web of life, or subtle field underlying and connecting all aspects of physical reality. Now a new story is coming into being through thousands of individuals, some of whom have had a shamanic or awakening experience that has opened their minds and their hearts to a different vision, a different understanding of reality. This new story tells us that light and love are the foundation of the entire universe and therefore the foundation of our being, our consciousness, our intelligence, and our infinite capacity for love. This new story tells us that we can relinquish our fear of death, knowing that our consciousness survives the death of the body, that in our essence we are immortal beings. When our body dies, we travel through a tunnel of light into another dimension of reality. As long ago as the 6th century BCE, the Greek philosopher Parmenides said, we are divine beings having a human experience. This new, new story tells us that divine spirit is the core of our being. The soul is the intermediary between spirit and body. Our body is the precious vehicle and temple of the soul and the means of our being able to incarnate on this planet. At the same time, it is a portal that can offer us access to the many dimensions of the inner universe and the experience of divine spirit within and around us. So if we ask, where does, our creativity, where does our creativity come from? We can know that it comes from the creativity of the cosmos. Life on this planet is part of the creativity of the cosmos, and we are part of that life. Think of the extraordinary creativity of our species from this carving on a Paleolithic cave to astronauts landing on the moon. Think of the incredible courage of our species, the will to survive through 200,000 years, the great explorers, the extraordinary imagination of the architects, artists, and astronomers, the skills of the masons and builders, the genius of the great musicians, the impulse of scientists to, cut, to discover and understand more the universe wants us to know why we are here, and the answer is gradually coming into being now. The shadow contains our capacity for both good and evil. It contains our undiscovered potential, our limitless creativity, everything we have not discovered about ourselves as well as personal and collective memories and traumas. Most people have no idea that there is an unknown aspect of themselves beyond the conscious mind. But if we want to be whole and to know ourselves better than we do, then it helps to have a map. In dreams, water and the sea are symbols of the soul and the greater consciousness which contains us. Now here is a diagram of the psyche or soul. And you can see that the yellow triangle at the top, the very top of the uh, diagram, represents what we call our conscious mind. But beyond the conscious mind is the personal unconscious. And beyond the personal unconscious is the matrix of the primordial soul, the collective unconscious or greater consciousness. And beyond all these is nature and the cosmos. So if you just bear in mind that yellow triangle as the tiny part of ourselves that, that we know already, and all the rest is the part that we don't know and that we really need to understand more about. The personal unconscious carries memories of parenting, school, societal influences, 
and forgotten traumas and experiences. Also the formation of what Jung called the animus and the anima. But the matrix of the collective unconscious or greater consciousness contains all the memories and instinctive habits and traumas of our evolutionary experience on this planet, going back thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years. So what we need to do is to open ourselves to awareness of this deeper matrix of consciousness so that we're in touch with it and so that it can nourish us really with the greatness of its memories and its creative power. For those who sincerely wish to work upon themselves, the most dominant collective shadow is the disbelief in the inner world. Because our materialist culture views the external physical world as the only reality, we have collectively negated the inner world. Furthermore, the imagination is our primary mode of access into the symbolic world. Yet over the centuries it has been denigrated by being regarded as mere fantasy. Rather than being held holy, the symbolic world has become imaginary, the stuff of children's tales. We don't believe in dragons anymore and have even lost the ability to walk in a symbolic world. The psychiatrist C.G. Jung could see the dangers of scientific materialism, the materialist philosophy which has so disastrously infiltrated world culture. And he wrote this, as scientific understanding has grown, so our world has become dehumanized. Man feels himself isolated in the cosmos because he is no longer involved in nature and has lost his emotional unconscious identity with natural phenomena. No voices now speak to man from stones, plants and animals, nor does he speak to them, believing they can hear. His contact with nature has gone. In another passage, he describes how, as the conscious mind gained more and more autonomy and independence from the deeper matrix of the psyche, the whole superstructure of consciousness became disengaged from the age-old instinctive ground out of which it has developed. Consciousness, thus torn from its roots, he said, possesses a Promethean freedom, but it also partakes of the nature of a godless hubris. Now access to the shadow is through our dreams. In a dream, the inner world talks to the world of consciousness. Speaking in the ancient language of images and symbols, the unconscious tells its stories. Sometimes these stories describe conflicts, joys or difficulties that are purely personal. But there are other dreams that express the collective song of the soul. A door is opened into the symbolic interior, into the world of gods, and through this doorway a music is heard that echoes and re-echoes. It awakens distant memories of when we walked as children upon the shore of the great ocean of life. And just as a child hears the roar of the ocean within a seashell, so we hear in such dreams the song of our own deepest nature. Now all ancient cultures honor the dream as a message from the gods. This beautiful painting is Jacob's dream of angels ascending and descending a ladder, stretching from earth to heaven. The dream Jung wrote is the small hidden door in the deepest and most intimate sanctum of the soul, which opens into that primeval cosmic light that was so long before there was a conscious ego and will be so far beyond what a conscious ego could ever reach.
The word psychology means the word or speech of the soul. Time devoted to paying attention to our dreams helps us to deepen our understanding of the speech of the soul. To become truly aware of our dream life and to create a relationship with the collective unconscious, the instinctive part of ourselves from which we are so estranged, we have to treat the dream with an attitude of profound respect. There has been enough evidence gathered during the past century alone to know with certainty that the dreamer who night after night conveys the messages to our sleeping self is far more important than we realize. This beautiful 15th century painting is by King René d'Anjou from his book, Le Livre du Coeur d'Amour et Fille. And here we see the king lying asleep in his bed and his heart is being given to his page who will then give it to another man who's going to take it on a journey, the journey of his heart. The dreamer is the source not only of dreams, but of symbol, myth and fairy tale, the ruler of a twilight kingdom which lies between the temporal and the timeless, or in theological terms, between man and God. Jung observed that dream symbols are the essential message carriers from the instinctive to the rational parts of the human mind, and their interpretation enriches the poverty of consciousness, so that it learns to understand again the forgotten language of the instincts. Gradually, one begins to recognize the sing signals of harmony or distress, continually deepening the sense of relationship between the two aspects of the psyche or soul, the infinitely older, wiser aspect and the younger, inexperienced aspect, the ego personality, which is trying to make sense of life. Through the assimilation of unconscious contents, the momentary life of consciousness can once again be brought into harmony with the law of nature from which it all too easily departs, and the individual can be led back to the natural law of his own being. Bringing our nature back into harmony is what he meant by the process of individuation. Dreams connect our time-bound world with the eternal one. Like the thread of Ariadne, they are a tenuous but vital link with the source of our being, one of the very few guides we have through the labyrinth of life. Without this thread connecting us to the fathomless source of our being, it is difficult to access the cooperation and guidance of the instinct, as well as to recognize and transform its immensely powerful and dangerous aspect that is symbolized in mythology by the Minotaur, the Gorgon and the Dragon. Only through a growing relationship with the soul can, a, the, can the destructive powers of the instinct be contained and transformed so that we are no longer condemned to sacrifice our lives to the fruitless labour of endlessly repeating the negative patterns of the past. The dream has a compensatory function in relation to the attitude of the conscious mind. It, it reflects the overall view of a deeper intelligence which can see both sides of the picture, both aspects of the psyche, that which is known to the dreamer and that which is unknown. If a conscious attitude is too rigid and limited, too inflated or too self-critical, if the individual carries a deep unconscious trauma which is asking for recognition and healing, if there is a danger of imbalance leading to mental or physical illness, the dream points the way to the integration of the deeper knowledge and insight of the unconscious mind with the conscious one, and therefore to a better state of balance.
To face the darkness of the soul and to learn how to relate to it is an act of heroism in an age which denies the existence of the soul and has come to disparage and reject whatever does not appear to be rational. Not surprisingly, in view of its neglect of the soul, our culture is now confronted by an eruption of the irrational in the form of hatred, of the hatred, anger and violence of terrorism, violent crime and self-destructive patterns of behaviour such as drug addiction and alcoholism, as well as an increase in mental illness. We try to eradicate the threat by exerting ever more control instead of looking at the causes which have given rise to these symptoms. It may be difficult to comprehend the idea that the terrorism and the crime we fight with weapons, armies and prisons, thinking to control and eliminate them, may be a manifestation of our own shadow, our own traumatized, split-off instincts. Because at the deepest level everything is connected, these dissociated instincts manifest in the world as an enemy intent on destroying us, an enemy whom we then attempt to destroy. This is an extremely difficult concept to understand and merits um, a great deal of attention and thought. Dreams can tell us what has happened and what is happening to the instincts. Since we have so little awareness of our instincts and even less knowledge of how to connect with them, we are deprived of the means of responding to them. With greater understanding, dreams can immeasurably enrich our lives. Dreams can give premonitions of the future, including those of our approaching transition to another state of being that we call death. Perseverance in the effort to understand the symbolic imagery of dreams brings its reward in the establishment of an attitude of nightly listening to the messages which come as visitors from that other dimension of reality. The gradual growth of understanding is occasionally marked by the visionary dream, a moment of revelation which can give direction and meaning to our life and is altogether outside our normal frame of reference even having a message for the culture as a whole. Now, 40 years ago, I had such a visionary dream, the greatest dream of my whole life. And it happened like this. I dreamt that it was a moonlight night and that it was the time of May, the time when the, the corn was becoming green or the wheat was becoming green. And I was skimming with bare feet over the surface of an immense green field until I came to a dolmen, a huge dolmen. And coming round the edge of the dolmen, I saw that there was an enormous net stretched across a valley between two hills. And on each hill was a man standing, holding the edges of the net. And I myself became entangled in the net, gazing up at the dark night sky. And in the night sky, I saw this extraordinary apparition of an immense woman, a goddess as I imagined her to be, filling the whole space between earth and heaven. And she had a great wheel in her abdomen. And she, I looked down at my body and saw that I too had a wheel like hers. And that my wheel was on the left. And she didn't speak, she said nothing but she indicated very clearly that I was to move my wheel and center it just as hers was centered. And so that is what I've spent 40 years doing, holding the image of that cosmic woman and dedicating my life to her service, bringing back the feminine principle into our culture, rescuing it from the obscurity into which it had fallen. Now I have to turn to the dangerous aspect of the shadow and the neglected instincts, because the shadow holds our power to destroy as well as our power to create. And in the words of Matthew Fox, the divine and the demonic are very close together. Only a thin line separates them. 
We who are capable of the divine are also capable of the demonic. And the deepest of all demonic activity is the use of our divine imaginations to invent destruction. I have to explain a bit what has happened to help you understand how the shadow has come into being or how the negative aspect of the shadow has come into being. The separation from nature that began with the emergence of the conscious mind from the older matrix of the soul some four to five thousand years ago inflicted a deep wound to the instincts and the soul. The will to power of the shadow arises from this wound and creates multiple variations of itself in the animosities and struggles for power that fill our world with discord, conflict and suffering. But at the root of them all is a cry of despair arising from the fact that we do not know why we are here or how deeply we are all connected to each other and to nature. Now, through the pressure of climate change, we are being led to, dis to rediscover our profound relationship with the life of the planet and heal the wound that arose with our separation from nature. We need to reconnect our conscious rational mind with the deeper matrix of the soul that we have lost contact with. And the principal organ of the soul is the heart. So many people suffer from depression and the root of this depression is our alienation from nature and our soul. The shadow problem of Western civilization arises from the fact that over the millennia of separation, the masculine archetype became associated with spirit and the feminine archetype associated with nature was split off from spirit. Nature and the earth were no longer ensouled, no longer sacred. And this split embedded in the patriarchal religions was the origin of our alienation from nature. Man became identified with spirit and with mind, and woman was identified with nature and the body, and both were subjugated to man. This is not to blame anyone or the religions. It happened because at the time this was seen to be the logical thing to be believing or the logical thing to be doing. It wasn't a deliberate um, split, as it were. The split came about unconsciously. But the catastrophic results of the loss of the feminine archetype are visible today in the trauma the planet has endured and is endure, enduring at our hands without our being aware of what we were doing, what we are still doing. We have lost the knowledge that once upon a time we lived within a sacred order where nature was experienced as the manifestation of spirit. The result of this loss can be seen in the wanton destruction of the Amazon and Indonesian rainforests and in all the other ways that we are polluting and harming the planet. Now we have reached the point where Sir David Attenborough tells us that the Garden of Eden is no more. We have become the most dominant and populous species on earth. Our effect on the natural world has been catastrophic, threatening up to one million animal and plant species with extinction. In his new book, A Life on Our Planet and his program on Netflix, he says that we have come to regard the earth as our planet run by humankind for humankind. We have moved from being part of nature to being apart from nature. And this hubris is part of our unconscious shadow behavior. Religions have put their emphasis on belief and belonging to a specific group they have not brought us together or healed the wounds humanity carries. They have not taught us about the divinity of our essential being and our profound relationship with nature. They have lost the essential message of their great founders, which was not about belief, but the transformation of consciousness, compassion and the loving service of life.
And then we have scientific materialism or scientism, which has told us that we are the only sentient beings in an inanimate mechanistic universe that is without life or meaning or purpose or intelligence. Consciousness begins and ends with the physical brain. When the brain dies, consciousness ceases to exist. Now imagine the effect on children who are taught these beliefs in school as if they were incontrovertible truth with nothing to challenge them. This nihilistic ideology offers no foundation for moral values which are increasingly vanishing from our world, dehumanizing us. Billions of people today live unconsciously, accepting and believing what they are told. But all this could change if we were given a different message about our profound relationship with each other and with nature and the cosmos. The negative shadow of our age manifests as a ruthless will to power. What happens is that unconscious predatory instincts take us over. When the feminine archetype is not recognized in our culture and in our lives, it manifests as a will to power. And we are now facing the dark shadow of Western civilization and the effects of believing ourselves to be separate from nature with power to control it. Jung could see all this happening decades ago, and he wrote this. Consciousness torn from its roots possesses a Promethean freedom, but it also partakes of the nature of a godless hubris with the assertion that nothing is greater than man and his deeds. God's powers have passed into our hands. The powers themselves are not evil, but in the hands of man they are an appalling danger in evil hands. Nuclear weapons are an unmitigated evil that we, the human species, have to our shame created. We have come to believe that it doesn't matter what we do to matter, that nature and matter are not sacred, that we are not part of that sacredness. We have not understood that what we do to so-called inanimate matter affects all of us at the subatomic level. The presence of these demonic weapons and their potential use pollutes not only the planet, but the human soul. There are now some 14,000 of them on high alert. But there is hope. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force on the 22nd of January, 2021, binding the nine nations with nuclear weapons to get rid of them by 2045. Jung warned us with these words, as at the beginning of the Christian era, so again today, we are faced with the problem of the general moral backwardness of our species, which has failed to keep pace with our scientific, technical and social progress. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger and we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. So here is a diagram of a psyche that's been possessed by the will to power of the um, deeply buried instincts. So you see at the top the conscious mind or ego and below it the personal shadow and the collective shadow or the predatory prey instincts which also are the origin of the will to power that is so destroying our world today and as i've said before the personal shadow contains the personal experience with the memories and traumas of our individual life as well as the imprinted beliefs that we've been indoctrinated with and the habits we've uh, derived from our um, social existence. Also the negative animus or anima, which is largely unconscious. 
And finally, in the collective unconscious, we have all the memories and dramas and habits of our evolutionary experience. And all these are wholly unconscious, including these predator-prey instincts, which are causing us such problems now. So what we've seen in the last century was the rise of the utopian ideologies communism and fascism, with leaders possessed by the will to power of the shadow, leading to mass psychosis in the population, where thousands or even millions of people were drawn into killing their fellow citizens at the will of these men. So on the left, we have Mao, who was responsible for killing 30 million of the citizens of China. We have Stalin, responsible for up to um, 100 million, although the number varies. We have Hitler, over 10 million. And we have in this century, we have Islamic State, which wanted to set itself up as the ruler of the world under Islam. And Jung commented on these psychoses. Although contemporary man believes that he can change himself without limit, the astounding or rather terrifying fact remains that despite civilization and the influence of religions, he is still morally as much in bondage to his instincts as an animal and can therefore fall victim at any moment to the beast within. Not by arming to the teeth, each for itself can the nations defend themselves from the frightful catastrophes of modern war. The heaping up of arms is itself a call to war. Rather, they must recognize those psychic conditions under which the unconscious bursts the dikes of consciousness and overwhelms it. They must recognize the psychic conditions under which the unconscious bursts the dikes of consciousness and overwhelms it. Now, we, we have recently seen the eruption of the shadow and um, consciousness being overwhelmed by the instincts in this attack on the capital on the 6th of January of this year. And here is another picture of the same attack. And you can see how people are taken over by the uh, will to power and are incited by leaders to acts of uh, violence against other people or against um, whatever they see as the enemy. This doesn't mean to say they can't criticize their governments, but violent um, uprising and the killing of people in the process is not acceptable. Now here we have a classic statement by, by Donald Trump that we must have American dominance in space. I feel sorry for space that even there we have to take our violence and our desire for dominance. The drive for absolute power and dominance arises from possession by the shadow, but also from a deep wound in childhood, which we know Donald Trump had, or from indoctrination, either religious or political. In mythology, the fight with the dragon symbolizes the struggle to overcome the enemy within, the predatory instincts carried in the most archaic and unconscious part of the shadow. The fight is portrayed here as this gigantic green dragon with a man trying to plunge his sword into it. Just look at the tiny man with this enormous dragon. We can never kill the dragon, but we can transform it by becoming aware of its power to take us over and resist that power through insight into what is happening. We can refuse to be taken over by it. So now we are faced with six major threats. First of all, climate change, nuclear war, which has been hanging over our heads since the 80s, population increase, which is estimated to reach um, 
10 billion by 2050. Technological insanity, more pandemics, and surveillance and manipulation by governments and also by the media giants. A threat that really we're not sufficiently aware of. So we need to become aware of the will to power of fundamentalist religions, the will to power of scientific materialism, the will to power of governments and social media, the will to power of specific groups and their leaders and their leaders, because each of these is open to becoming possessed by the unconscious shadow, brilliantly depicted here by Picasso, who did this drawing at the end of the Second World War. So the shadow of politics is revealed in totalitarian or authoritarian control. And we can see it today in China, in North Korea, in Russia, where the people are trying to overthrow Putin, in Iran, in Turkey, in India, in Pakistan, in Burma, where the military are once again trying to impose their control over the population in Saudi Arabia, Belarus, and Uganda, among others. The pandemic and technology are increasing the ability of governments to expand the control and surveillance over people's lives. Democracy is fragile and is not secure, even where it exists or where it's claimed to exist. and the pervasive tentacles of the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us all about <clears throat> are seen here and together with arms sales. And together these constitute an unrecognized pathology. I'm not go going to go into the actual numbers because you can look it up for yourself on Google. But in striking contrast, Costa Rica has abolished its army in 1948 and devoted the money saved to education, health care, and restoring the former rich ecology of the state. It's a most beautiful place to visit now, thanks to the changes that were made in 1948. So we have to look at other aspects of the will to power, and one of them is to be found in feminism, because of woman's long oppression, feminism and feminists can fall victim to being driven by the will to power of the shadow. There are many wrongs that need to be righted, but never in a way that demonizes or diminishes and rejects men. There has to be a gentleness in the way that people go about this change. Then, in the last few decades, there's been the revelation of the predatory sexual abuse of boys by Catholic and Protestant priests, <clears throat> and also the shocking growth of sexual abuse of children generally, which has reached enormous proportions now on the internet and is not controlled by the media giants. And all this is part of the negative shadow of our civilization, which is now being real, revealed to us in its full horror and it really is horror when you think of the suffering of the children involved. Then there are also transgender issues which are obsessing our culture today. The LGBT community risks being taken over by the will to power, forcing its views on the wider community and attacking those who challenge aspects of its agenda, as JK Rowling has been attacked. In a secular society which has no agreed template of moral values, we believe we can do anything we want to the body. The body has become disconnected from the soul. In the child, the distress of the soul is projected onto the body, which may be forced to submit to its mutilation or the sacrifice of its gender 
inflicting untold distress and ir irreversible damage on it. Gender transition should never be allowed under the age of 18 when neither the body nor the mind is mature. Nor should children be introduced to these ideas in primary school when they are too young to comprehend their meaning and their implications and may be confused and even frightened by them. The shadow is most clearly seen on social media in the millions of despicable, cruel and destructive negative projections onto individuals, prominent people and groups and the attempt to cancel people or um, um, destroy their livelihood or get them sacked from their jobs, whatever it might be. A very unpleasant manifestation of the shadow can clearly be seen now on social media. A remarkable book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, published in 2020, lays out in horrifying detail the treatment of the black and indigenous people by the white settlers of North America. It also shows how the Nazi regime in Germany in the 1930s copied this American model for its persecution of the Jews. And it details the millennia long indescribable suffering of the lowest caste in India, the untouchables or Dalits as they are called today. This book reveals the will to power of the shadow in the persecution of all those who are deemed inferior and therefore subject to the power, control and dominance of the superior race, caste, class or gender. We can see this shadow today from the Chinese persecution of the Muslim Uyghurs to the attempts to cancel freedom of speech in universities and in the public arena. Out of the persecution of the black people in North America has come the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now I want to look at the predator prey pattern in the shadow because this is where all this trouble is coming from. It's basically the instinct to attack, humiliate, silence, cancel, dominate and control others. It's the justification of murder, bestial cruelty and persecution. It can be activated by leaders who evoke terror or fear or the need to defend against a threat. And it can arouse rage and hatred and envy and greed, sacrificing others to the dominance of a powerful group. And it can lead to indoctrination of people, arousing religious or political fanaticism against others. And all this comes from the will to power of the in unconscious instinct, particularly negative instincts. Obviously not the instinct to heal, but it's the instinct to destroy, to defend, and it's basically um, a protection against fear. Evil has its origins in the unconscious predator-prey pattern of behavior. It may be defined as the intention to inflict or the act of inflicting terror, suffering, humiliation, torture or death on an individual or group of individuals. All that is needed to constellate evil is for a single psychopathic or deluded, deluded individual to trigger a mass psychosis in one group of people projecting the enemy onto another group and arousing attack on it by demonizing and dehumanizing it. But the real enemy is within our own nature. Evil comes from fear, the primordial fear of not being able to survive, fear of death above all. Our terrible weapons are crystallized fear. In attacking, killing and demonizing others, we exercise our own fear and sense of powerlessness. So if we look at the nations today, the main nation, uh, America, Russia, China, the big powers, they're all defending against each other 
They're all defending against a future threat. All this is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous waste of life. Uh, I don't know how to put it more strongly, but they're all embedded in this habit of preparing for danger to come, which has gone on for centuries or millennia. And unless we bring it to an end, it will indeed be the end of our species. Jung said that one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And this is what I've tried to do in this talk. How do we make the collective darkness conscious? By addressing the wounds that are crying out to be healed so that we don't continue to repeat the sacrificial rituals of the past. I've kept this terrible photograph from uh, a leper, I think, um, with a white helmet rescuing this child from a bombing raid. This picture makes me weep with pity for the human species that is still so unconscious. So how do we make our individual darkness conscious? By befriending the dragon, strangely enough. Create a relationship with the shadow, becoming aware of the wounds that are the origin of negative projections onto others. Wounds that are carried in the heart that need healing. Listen to feelings of anger, fear, hatred, envy, grief, anxiety or depression and to negative feelings about other people. Help these feelings to become conscious without projecting, projecting them onto others. Name them, write down these feelings or draw or paint a picture of them if you can. And do this for as long as necessary for these powerful instincts to be acknowledged. Speak to them as if to another person who is in need of your help. As the dragon is transformed, it gives us access to the treasure it guards. Because we are all connected at the subatomic level, what one individual does affects the whole. The immense power of the instincts will no longer be able to take possession of our soul. They will become our friend instead of our enemy. Their enormous energy will be released in the power to heal or in some kind of creative activity. Love or the longing to help others will flow from the heart and will replace anger, fear and hatred. This infinite capacity for love and compassion is the treasure that the dragon guards, the treasure of the divine spirit within us, now released from bondage to the will to power of the untransformed instincts. The great work of alchemy was about freeing the imprisoned spirit. And this was also the teaching of the four great spiritual traditions about our essential divine nature and the need to transform ourselves through the power of love. So here we have the values of a heart which need to be cultivated in order to overcome the destructive power of the instincts. So we have love, compassion, empathy, wisdom and truth, respect for all life, justice and freedom of speech, beauty and harmony, and the longing to heal, nurture, protect and cherish. So in this beautiful alchemical picture, <clears throat> we see Sophia, the Holy Spirit, 
wearing a crown and a star on her head and with wings, welcoming a man emerging from the waters of the unconscious. She is holding a red robe, which symbolizes the final stage of alchemy, welcoming him as he emerges. And around them are all the pictures and the beautiful um, images of nature, the flowers, the birds, and the animals. So this is really, this picture is a summary of everything that I've tried to say in this talk, of the work we need to do to redeem the unconscious instinct, to bring it into the light of consciousness, to transform it, thereby doing the work of rescuing spirit that is so buried within us, and yet is waiting for resurrection waiting for redemption.